Hello, my dear friend, and welcome back to Wisdom for Life. My name is Alan Bagg. One of the greatest things Jesus said we know to be the Great Commission, and that is that we got to go out and make disciples. Notice it says make disciples, not just make converts. So it's not just about, you know, leading someone to Jesus. It's about discipling that person. Each one of us have been given a responsibility to lead people to Jesus. Now, it's something that I want to do all the time, but sometimes people are a little nervous about it and they wonder, you know, if I could, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I'm that type of person. Why not make a decision that this year you're going to lead at least one person to Jesus? Think about that. If every single one of us each led just one person to Jesus, it would double the body of Christ at each one, one, one. Be encouraged by this message. You know that God teaches us things line upon line, precept upon precept. It makes sense. It's useless teaching somebody something if they don't have the foundation to it. And so we have walked the road this year, developing in our lives a desire to see God's grace manifesting. How many want to see the fullness of grace? I want that grace abounding. When he talks about his grace abounds, that you always have all sufficiency in all things. All things is not just money. All things includes a healthy marriage. All things includes a healthy family, children. They're able to parent them well and have children that are responsive to the Word of God. All things include success in your workplace. All things includes the grace and glory of God manifesting in your ministry, your home cells, whatever position of helps you're in, that there's only so much I can do in my own natural ability. But I'm trusting God for supernatural. I mean, we, the world out there is doing everything they can in their natural, but I mean, they've proved already. I mean, I proved in my own life that what I did in my own ability didn't work too well. How many would say amen to that? My bank balance proved it. My, my life proved it. My marriage proved it. Me trying to do things in my own ability. I blew up a lot of things and almost lost a lot of things. Did lose a lot of things. Now you know what I'm talking about. The world has proved they can't figure out. I mean, you, you would think that after 6,000 years of humanity, they would have solved some problems. Instead, life has got worse. There are diseases today. They got no. There were, there's diseases today that didn't even exist years ago and they've developed all the vaccines for the old ones things that used to wipe out whole cities they've developed vaccines but they, there's still diseases they still can't fix today why? because there's an enemy behind it there's a demonic force behind it you got to recognize that if you're trying to do things in your own natural ability Satan, he's not stupid now in certain areas he is You've got to be pretty stupid to think you can win against God. <laughs> but he's not ignorant. That's what I'm trying to say. He, you know, he, 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 as I say, he could wipe out whole cities, whole nations with a disease. But then man managed to figure it out. Well, all he has to do is just adapt his ways. And now he's managed to figure out a few diseases that we still can't get a hold of. And I know that in the natural, people say, well, one day we will find a cure. But then there'll be another disease. Yeah. The enemy's relentless. But the only thing that can solve all diseases is Jesus who took every infirmity and bore every sickness and every disease. That's the only place you're going to find divine life. Never mind just healing, but life. You'd think that by today, after so many attempts at different forms of leadership, you look at all kinds of autocracies and, you know, different kinds of democracies and uh, kings and all, you know, man's tried almost every way to rule a nation. And still, you've got anarchy and they don't know how to control it. Even in the great form of democracy, you just get enough people upset with the way things are. They'll just rise up and say, well, then forget this government. Isn't that right? But you can't have peace without the Prince of Peace. Amen. So, with all these things that we're dealing with, we must recognize there's only so much that you and I can do in the natural. 
There is only so much that you and I can succeed in. You, you reach a point where, where, you, where you can't see beyond. That's where we have to rely on the supernatural. Ever since I've been born again, I found out there's, there's a limitation to my life. I always knew it, but I don't let that limitation bother me anymore. If God says, go for it, I'm going to go. I don't care what I feel like. I don't care whether I think I can do it or not. I don't care whether I think I'm well trained in or not. If God says do it, that means He has given me a grace for it. There's a grace that by the time you get to that place, like He says, run through that door. And you know as you're moving, you go, you, you're running at the speed of light. And that door is coming up. And you know that if that door doesn't open, you're going to slam into that thing real hard. But if God said go, you keep going. And by the time you get there, grace enables you to step through that door in victory. It's that grace where that is sufficient for all things. And God's developing us to get into that place. And we found out that it's important for that grace to operate, that we are operating as a company of believers, not just on our own as individuals. God has chosen to place us in a body. There's a specific place. It's not a religion that we join. It's not a club that we, we, we spend time with as long as everybody does things my way. As long as everything, you know, the music's what I like, the chair's what I like, I like the way you speak, but then I didn't like what you said there. Or well, now I'm upset with people or fight with someone and then decide to join another club down the road. Come on. No, we're a family. And God has placed us. He knows the pastor you need. I said, God knows who you need. And He places us very specifically. Amen. He knows the one that can speak to us. And I need to have someone in my life that doesn't put up with all my wrongs. I need to have somebody that's, that's anointed by God that can help expose my problems and my errors so that I can... Not to judge, not to condemn, but out of love so that I can walk the road that Jesus paid for his, with his life for. Amen. And so we're developing this grace. We found out that faithfulness is a vital key to our lives. Faithfulness. Walking accurately. Trusting God. Who can find a faithful man? I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. When we stand before Jesus, and He says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's not a prize at the end. We're faithful today. I said we're faithful today. I want Him to look at me today and say, well done, good and faithful servant. How do you say amen to that? Well, God's developing us. And we as a church have grown in these things. We're developing in it. I believe we've got to a place now where God is saying, now I need my church to recognize that these are things that we know. Like Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come and He'll remind us of what we've already been taught. See, all the, most times, obviously if there's a new believer, everything's new. Every time we say, wow, I never knew that was in the Bible. Wow, I never knew. But eventually, when you've been a Christian for two, three, four years, you kind of know a lot of doctrine. I'm not talking about revelation. Our revelation gets deeper and deeper and deeper. But the knowledge of what's in the scriptures is, is you know, you, you, you already know what Jesus did and you know the price, you know about grace, you know about righteousness, you know about, are you with me? You know the facts of the Bible. So there's not much more that somebody can teach us. Amen. If I stood up here today and said, did you know there's a third heaven? Most people go, yeah, amen. <laughs> now, a new person might say, I didn't know there was three heavens. But that's what the Bible teaches us. So, what am I saying is that I'm not going to be learning a big aha. But very often what happens is the things that I have learned, I can let slip. When I first learned it, it was new to me. I got excited about it. I started putting it into action. 
And by putting it into operation, I saw grace manifesting. And as grace manifested, it did what it did. God makes grace abound that I always have all sufficiency in that thing. And when I do, there's an abundance to help everybody around me. And I'm walking, wow, this thing is real. It actually works. God's good and all these things are happening. But then what happens is as I grow, I start to learn other things. And then other things become more important. And my focus shifts onto something else. And it can happen that I lose sight of something. And every now and then, the Holy Spirit will remind us. And He usually does it through our pastor. Through a situation. Through something. And it will reignite a desire and a passion. And when we return to the former things, then you see once again. Because sometimes that can happen. After you've been a Christian for many years, I've watched it over the years. I know it's happened in my life. You can get to a place where if you're not cautious, you can start to become lukewarm. Kind of just go to church because that's what we do. And I made a point. I will not let myself slip into lukewarm. If I start picking it up, if I start tasting that lukewarm, I, I want to sort it out before my Jesus needs to vomit. Now you see a whole bunch of new Christians say, what? <laughs> Jesus said, I wish you were hot or you were cold. Go read it. It's in Revelation. I wish you were hot or whether you're cold. If you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out my mouth. I didn't say that. Your Savior said that. Amen. Amen. So I don't want to get to that point. So I'm going to make sure that I stay on fire. So that's why I, I ask the Holy Spirit to help me. If something's lacking, stir me up. Because I will take that. If you just ignite something, I'll stir it up in my heart. And he has been speaking to me a, along the, those lines just recently on something that he wants to see stirred up once again here at the Bay Christian Family Church. So I just need to ask how many of you are committed to the vision here? Amen. Amen. So that's who I'm talking to. How many of you committed to Jesus? Maybe you're not a member at the Bay Christian Family Church, but you're watching on the internet or whatever. How many of you committed to Jesus and his cause? Then you're in the right place. Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, when he says man there, he's not implying, you know, the son of Joseph. Joseph was a man. That's not who, the word man, if, if this was written in the Hebrew, see this is translated from the Greek, this particular portion. If it was translated, if it was written in Hebrew, he would have said, who do men say that I, the son of Adam, am? The son of Adam. See, Adam was the first man created. But God referred to Adam, not just as an individual, but as mankind. Because even when he had brought Eve out of the side of Adam, there were two of them. He still referred to both of them as Adam. You can go read it. The Bible says that Adam called his wife Eve. But whenever God addressed them, he addressed them as Adam. And I believe that if Adam never failed, we'd all be Adam. Mankind. Are you with me? Why? Because we would be one family. And great, 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 that's why he was referred to as the last Adam. Last Adam. So Jesus came born as God's original plan. A mankind that God recognized as a family, not a religion. When he created man, he didn't create a religion. If Adam never failed, chances are there'd be no church buildings. There'd be no pastors. Why? Because we'd all be walking with God. We wouldn't have somebody necessary to teach us. Because we'd be fellowshipping one-on-one -on -one with God. 
So when Jesus came, he didn't come to start a religion. He came to reestablish the relationship God had with the first Adam. Amen. That's God's desire. God's desire is not to meet you once a week on a Sunday in a church building. God does not want a religious ritual with you. He wants a relationship. He desires to fellowship with us. And that's his original plan. His original plan has never changed. God says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, he'd have to maybe use a different method because now what would happen is that God knew that man would fall, and so he had made sure that Jesus was crucified. The Bible says he was crucified before the foundation of the earth. Why? Because once God decides to do something, it's done. It doesn't matter when it plays out in the natural. So Jesus was already set up as our sacrifice, and God had to play that through. But his plan has never changed. His plan is always, the reason Jesus did that was to redeem us back into a relationship with God that he had with the first Adam. Hallelujah. See, the last Adam walked that way. When Adam, when Jesus came into the earth as the last Adam, he walked with God. He fellowshiped with God. The same way God would come down in the cool of the day and fellowship with Adam, he did that with Jesus. You often see Jesus slipping off to go and spend time with the Father. I don't do anything unless I've heard my Father say it. That, think about that for a moment. If he didn't do anything unless he saw his father do it, there's 24 hours in the day. If he met with God once a week, what would he do today? <laughs> Hello. You realize he's, he's listening to God all the time. He's walking with him. He's having him guide him. He doesn't do anything, doesn't say anything unless he's heard him say it. So he's in a continuous intimate relationship with the father. Continuous intimate relationship. So he's saying, yeah, this is what he's identifying. I'm the son of Adam. Now, when people look at me, what are they thinking? When they see me, who are they seeing? And so the disciples answered him, verse 14. Some say John the Baptist. I realized John the Baptist was dead by this stage. Some say Elijah. He's dead even longer. Some say Jeremiah. These guys are long dead. Some say the prophets. One of the prophets. So you understand, these people are, th are thinking in the area of reincarnation. They're seeing Jesus do things. And they think, this is one of the prophets come back from the dead. So then Jesus asks a very important question. He says, but who do you say that I am? I get the impression he really wasn't interested in what other people were saying. It was a conversation starter. Who do men say that I am? Oh, they say Elijah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist. He says, okay, hang on now. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Now, that family is a massive question. I said it on Friday that I believe that just on that one statement, I could spend four weeks on that. Who do you say Jesus is? I'm asking you. If Jesus looked at you and said, who do you say that I am? What would be our answer? Who do you say I am? Is he your ticket to heaven to get you out of hell? Is he just simply a religion? Is he somebody that will help you when you're sick? Maybe I got a bill to pay and I can call on Jesus. He's, he's my banker. Who do you say Jesus is? Who is he to you? Imagine you wake up one morning and it's really cold and so you sleep in a little bit. But while you're sleeping in, uh, you, 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 you fall asleep and you oversleep. 
And all of a sudden, you've got to jump out. You realize you, you shock awake and you're like, I'm late for work. And all the kids and everything, you know, you run down the passage. Guys, get up, get up. We're late, we're late. Go, 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 go. Everybody get dressed. And you rush and you're getting every, everyone out of bed. And you rush through to the kitchen. Go get their lunches ready and get their breakfasts ready. And as you rush into the kitchen, there Jesus is sitting at your kitchen table in his flesh body. He's sitting there. You, you walk in and there he is a man sitting at your table. And you realize it's Jesus. And he's found your Bible and he's got it open on the table. He's been just paging through it. And he looks up at you with a big smile and says, Come sit down here for a while. I want to show you something. And you go, Jesus, ah, oh my Jesus, ah, we, man, I've got to get the kids off. I mean, you know, just hang in there. I'll, I'll be right now. Kids, get out. You won't believe who's sitting at the table. And they come running. That's Jesus, by the way. Come quickly. I've got to get you. Come, lunch, lunch, and breakfast. And get them shoved out, out the door and say, Jesus, I'll be right back. And you run and take the kids to school and you rush back. But because of the traffic and everything, now you're late for work. You think, man, Jesus, I've got to, I've got to get to work. I, you know what? Lunchtime. I'm going to come back here. Don't go anywhere. I'll see you later. And so you walk in the door and throw the keys and fall down on the couch and put the television on. Just take a deep breath and then you hear a noise. And there Jesus is still at the kitchen table. And Jesus looking said, I want to show you something. I said, Jesus, man, I'm really tired. Can I just watch just a little bit of TV? I'll, I'll be there now. I just want to just chill, just unwind. And as you slouch past the kitchen table and say, Jesus, you know what? It's been a hectic day. I'll see you in the morning. And we go to bed. I wonder. If you saw Jesus sitting at your table physically, would that have happened? If you walked in and saw Jesus, ah! Jesus, he's sitting there. What would happen? That's the day canceled, isn't that right? Don't come on, I'm just sitting down. Don't worry about school. Eh? Isn't that right? That's how we would react. But family, do you know what? Jesus is waiting every morning. He wants to sit with you, and he wants to show you his word. As children of God, we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Who do you say Jesus is? Who is he to you? In this series, Alan Bagg will help you identify your purpose as a child of God. Every one of us have the capability of leading people to Jesus. He shares practical ways to help you fulfill your call and will also help you walk confidently in your purpose, experiencing God work in and through your life. See, if I have a relationship with a religion I have nothing else but religion to give to somebody but if I have a relationship with a living Christ I don't have to do much convincing get your series today by contacting us here at Allen Bag Ministries you know we've probably all heard the anecdote where it says how do you eat an elephant well it's one bite at a time. Now, I don't think anybody wants to eat an elephant, but praise God, we are called to lead people to Jesus. And sometimes the job seems so big, it's so massive, there's so many people we need to get saved, so many people in my family, friends, you know, everybody at work. How do I go about leading people to Jesus? And sometimes we feel that, you know, I'm not that person, I feel a little introvert. Well, what I like to do is say, well, is it possible to lead one person to Jesus? Just one, just think of one individual that you can pray for and commit to and make a decision to lead that person to Jesus. Out of that knowledge, birth this message, each one win one. Because if we're all doing that, <laughs> it'll have a great power in the kingdom of God. This is a three-part series that's going to help build your faith towards that. Maybe you've been a little hesitant. You're not sure if you are able to do it or not. By the time you've listened through this, you'll have great faith. I believe that loved one that you so greatly desire to see, know the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll have the ability, the confidence, and the knowledge that God is working with you and you are working with God to bring that person 
to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, get your set today. It'll help build and develop your faith. Now, friend, if you've never yet made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, today is your day. You're the one that we're reaching out to today. And maybe you're sitting there watching this program. You just happened across this channel. I want you to know it's not by accident that you and I have got together like this. God wants you to know He loves you. He gave His life for you. He died for you. And then He rose from the dead, proving that your sins are paid for. All you have to do is believe that. The Bible says if you believe with your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead and confess with your mouth that He's Lord and Savior, you will be saved. So let's pray that prayer now. Say this out loud there where you're watching. Say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you. You gave your life for me. You died for my sins. And then you rose from the dead, proving my sins are forgiven. Thank you. From this day on, I call you my Lord. You are my Savior. I choose to serve you, to worship you, to honor you. One day, I will leave this earth and stand in front of you and see you face to face. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God, my friend. You are born again, a child of God. I have something I'd like to send you now. This card's going to explain to you what's just happened or some guidelines now that you are a Christian. This is a Bible study program that will help you read your Bible cover to cover within a year. And then my Christian passport out of this world of failure into His kingdom of victory. That's my free gift to you. I want to sow this into your life and we'll pay the postage as well. If you can just call me on that phone number or write to us at that address. As soon as we got your details, I'll send that to you and we'll get to you in a few days time. Well, that's all we have time for today. I look forward to being with you again tomorrow. This is Alan Bagg reminding you Jesus is Lord. Remember, life is a choice. Choose life. God bless you. Alan Bagg Ministries is making the series that featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs available to you for purchase. Choose life.